For the last few weeks on Sunday morning in our sermon, we have been speaking to you on Jesus' viewpoint of the authority of the Word of God. I want to continue that, but I'm going to move it to this afternoon. And this morning, I want us to examine a very fundamental problem that has been for a long time in the world, the religious world, when it comes to learning the way of salvation, especially when it comes to understanding what the New Testament teaches concerning the church and the plan of salvation. How is it possible for one to be sincerely religious, but wrong and lost, that is, separated from God and in need of salvation? I say, how is that possible? Doesn't being sincerely religious equal salvation? Are not the two ideas synonymous? Well, in generally, uh, in general speaking, the denominational churches have long taught, in just so many words, explicitly, and by those words, implicitly, or we may say at the very least, they've encouraged the very old false slogan, it makes no difference what you believe as long as you're sincere in believing it. I guess we can say that maybe the more updated concept, we'll call it the revised version, is it makes no difference if you believe just so you're sincere. That tends to go along more with our age today than the other one. It makes no difference if you believe just so you're sincere. Well, what about it? Can one who believes in God and Christ and the Bible be devoutly religious and still be lost in sins? And if they died in that state, they would spend an eternity in a devil's hell. Well, I assure you that the Bible answers this question and answers it very definitely. Remember, God has anticipated in His providential care, in His omniscience, every error, every false doctrine that would ever come before mankind and given us the answer to it, the refutation of it, in a rightly divided Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means spiritually complete before God, truly or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Thus, when somebody says, well, this is the will of heaven, and if you will believe this, God will accept you. If it is not taught in the Bible, it's false doctrine and will damn your soul to hell. I don't know how to be any plainer than that. It would be such a ridiculous thing to say, well, God's given of His will in the words of the Bible. But really, you can take them or leave, him, leave them. You might truly understand this to be the way that He said it. But there are a lot of good people over here who are sincere in what they believe. And they're very pious in their activities. And who's to say whether they're lost or not? That has long been a view that has... Uh, been around in the denominational churches, but all too much over the last 50 years, grown up in the church to the point to where so many over the years in the church have said, well, we're just a denomination just like the rest of them. The idea of a denomination is where you have one body of Christ, yet all the different churches make up that one body each one believing different things and things that contradict what others believe and teach. Well, now, you find that in the last will and testament of the one who shed his blood to purchase the church as a proper definition of the Lord's church when it comes to the oneness or the unity and how it's obtained. I said then that 
the inspired Word of God has the answer. Well, as we seek to learn the Bible answer to this question, how is it possible for one to be sincere religious but wrong and lost in sins, then we want to consider a few things from God's good Word. First of all, we'll go back to the Old Testament in the very beginning. Cain, by the way, the firstborn of all mankind, was religious. Just drive a peg down right there. Nobody can deny that Cain was religious. You can't say, oh, Cain, he wasn't religious at all. That's just not so. You will find in reading the accounts in Genesis, Moses inspired the Holy Spirit wrote it, just like Paul inspired the Holy Spirit wrote most of the books of the New Testament. Thus, it is God's infallible will. And he states that Cain made a sacrifice after building an altar. Now, in the patriarchal age, the father rule period, covered in the Bible from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, down to the giving of the law of Moses to the children of Israel in Exodus chapters 19 and 20, that's the way they worshipped. By building altars and giving something that was very important to them, that's the idea of sacrifice, to God. Well, what was that something? God had decreed plainly what He wanted. And the man did not do it, but he was religious. He took the time to build the altar. He took what he had raised, if you please, and offered it on the altar. So he worshipped. He was religious. However, his apparent sincerity in doing what he did did not excuse his unauthorized sacrifice so that God would say, it's all right, he's sincere in what he did. We'll accept it. Genesis 4, 3 through 5. And look at that great Hall of Fame chapter on faithful service to God in Hebrews 11 and specifically number 4. And you'll see where the Holy Spirit in the New Testament commended Abel, not Cain, as an example to follow in submitting to the will of heaven. By faith, speaking of Abel, he offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Well, if all that one has to do and be in order for his life to be acceptable to God is to be sincere, surely this man was sincere in what he did. He was religious, but lost. Then we come on down to the days of the law of Moses being Israel's approach to God, Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 5. And we come to the time of the division of the ten northern tribes from the two southern tribes, Judah, the predominant tribe, and Benjamin. And Jeroboam is introduced to us as the first king of the northern Israelite, the kingdom of Israel, Israelite kingdom. And he was zealous in religion and devotion while he built new altars and objects of worship. He appointed a new priesthood and even declared certain days to be holy feast days, 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 32. And yet, when you look in chapter 14 and verse 16 of, I think it's 1 Kings 12. If you not read all three or four, five or six of those chapters, you, you'll find it there somewhere. Of him, the inspired writers declared that he made Israel to sin. Well, sin's the transgression of the law. Uh, are you going to say the man was not sincere in what he did? He was as sincere as Cain was. Sincerely religious. But he was lost in sin. You can't make people sin by what you teach and do and be acceptable to God yourself. The Pharisees of Jesus' day, that would be, of course, the early part of the first century A.D., were among the most zealous religious people among God's own people under the law, the Jews, of that day and time. 
But surely just a cursory reading of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and our Lord dealing with them uh, would make us wonder about them at least, at the very least. Jesus openly was into it with them all the time, rebuking them repeatedly and exposing their errors and literally condemning them for their hypocrisies. He even called them the sons of hell, Matthew 23, 15. Now, you can't get plainer than that. Well, who did he call sons of hell? Sincere religious people. They were religious, folks. How can anybody say they were not religious? But they were lost. Or else the son of God's a liar. If that's the case, let's close the doors and go somewhere. But as we go through after the church is established and we turn to the book of Acts as it was written by the inspired Luke, the physician that went with Paul, much of his preaching cures, and we find the conversion of the Ethiopian nobleman. Now let's go back before his conversion as to what Luke records about the man. He was sincere in his religious practice. Why, he had come from Ethiopia under the kingdom of Candace. He was her treasurer, very important man. And that meant he had to travel some 750 miles. And how did he travel? By an old primitive vehicle, a chariot. Now, it was probably the best they had, and I'm sure he had about the best that... Uh, Ethiopian nobleman would have, but compared to what we have today, it just doesn't work too well. And why did he do all that? Why, it was to worship God in Jerusalem according to the law of Moses. Not only that, he hadn't been so filled up with what went on in Jerusalem that he decided that's enough. On his way back, he's reading the Bible and trying to think through Isaiah 53 as to who the prophet was speaking of there. Acts 8, 27 and 28. However, the fact that an angel of God and the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, brought Philip, the gospel preacher, into contact with this man, verses 26, 29, for the express purpose of his being able to hear the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, and in this chapter, verse 35, conclusively indicate that this man was in a lost condition. But he was sincere. This man's zeal and sincerity, I would commend to anyone anywhere that we should emulate him in our approach to the study of God's Word and in devotion to God. Yes, he was religious, but at this stage, he was lost in his sincere devotion. He needed to hear and believe and obey the gospel. That's the reason the Holy Spirit through Luke was recorded that one case of conversion as well as all of the rest. But then as we go a little further in the New Testament, we come across a certain person by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Now he was sincerely zealous in his convictions. I suppose as sincerely zealous and fervent in his convictions as anybody possibly can be. And I would say in your attitude toward God and His Word and being a Christian, you should incorporate into your life that zeal and fervency to know and do the will of God. He says uh, concerning the law that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee, which always represented at that time the strict adherence to the law. And he even said this. I doubt any other Pharisee could say this. Who concerning the law, blameless. Now you think about that a minute. That's a mouthful. Well, when you go over to Philippians 3, 5 through 6, you'll get the whole story where Paul by inspiration recorded that as he wrote to the Lord's church. In Philippi, his zeal for the law of Moses led him to believe 
Here's what he said of his own mouth as the Spirit guided him to say it. That he ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That means contrary to the authority of Christ, which means contrary to the New Testament of Christ. He said, these things I also did. And he mentions the specific persecutions of arresting Christians, persecuting them. Even called himself the chief of sinners. Well, you find this in our case in Acts 26, 9. There are three accounts of his conversion. He proved his sincerity by leading a very terrible and harsh persecution against Christians. You remember that he held the clothes of those who stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr, a martyr being one who dies for his faith. And the persecution that arose after the death of Stephen was so strong that he scattered the church out of Jerusalem. And the only ones of the church remaining in Jerusalem were the apostles. And thus they went everywhere preaching the word. That's how strong he was and what he was doing to persecute the church. You think he wasn't sincere? But when Saul asked Jesus, when the Lord appeared to him as he was headed on another persecution circuit to Damascus to arrest Christians, the Lord appeared to him, and one of the things he asked the Lord is, is what must I do? Well, the Lord has put the gospel into earthen hands into the church and the Lord didn't tell him he just told him to go where he would find out because the Lord had already appeared to a member of the church a gospel preacher and Ananias and told him what was going on with Saul he's waiting on you there to hear what he must do to be saved well of course when the gospel preacher got there he didn't say now your sincerity and zeal are above average and that's sufficient you don't need to do anything to be saved but to hear her tell it all around us, that's what, to be consistent with the doctrine that all you need to do is be sincere and you'll be saved, that's all they would have to tell him. Rather, Jesus told Saul, as I said earlier, to go into Damascus to the street called Straight. There he will be told, notice it's obligatory, it's imperative, what he must do. Chapter 22 of Acts, verses 8 through 10. Now that resulted in his being baptized for the remission of his sins, Acts 22, 16. You see, he's a believer who by his own life and his fasting and praying evidences his repentance and certainly he's confessing the Christ that he had once persecuted, but he doesn't know how to do the very thing needed as the last step in getting forgiveness of his sins. So as a believer who has repented of all of his life, and what a life that was to repent of, obeyed the gospel when in Acts 22, 16, Ananias told him, And now why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sin. So being sincere and devoted to a religious cause, even one that believes in God, is not acceptable to God. A person can still be lost. Now, what washed away his sins? Well, Jesus shed his blood on the cross for the remission, the forgiveness of our sins. He was tempted in every point, like as we are, yet without sin, so he could be the Lamb of God that could go up on the cross, suffer, bleed, die, offering his body a sacrifice for sin. And thus, through the gospel of Christ, the glad tidings of Christ, we learn the terms of pardon, whereby when our faith in Christ is formed by the truth of the New Testament concerning Christ, Romans 10, 17, then we can resolve in our minds and obedience to Acts 17, 30 to fully repent of our sins. And then according to Romans 10, 10, having repented, we can confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Now we're qualified before God to make the final step to become a Christian to gain remission of sins. And that's exactly Saul of Tarsus. This man who was as devout and sincere in his religion before he obeyed the gospel as anybody could be, even believing God, the God of the Bible. But he had to be brought to believe in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as a son of God 
As Jesus had said in John 14, 6, even to his apostles, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He could be as devout and sincere in his fervent persecution of the church and doing it because he believed God wanted him to, trying to stamp out, stamp out this false religion as he wanted to. But he had to believe the truth. And the truth said Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, not a false Messiah. And thus, when he had done that, he contacted the blood of Christ shed on Calvary's cross for the rest of our sins when he was baptized into the death of Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4. And Revelation 1, 5 says plainly that the blood washes away sins. But you've got to contact it. Now, where do you contact it? According to Romans chapter 6, and remember, Paul was going back over with the Romans at what point they became a Christian. At what point the blood washed their sins away. Well, nobody can go back to the cross. Stand under it with the Lord's body on it, with the blood dripping on his head. Then enter the tomb literally and actually with the body of Christ. And then when the stones rolled away and Christ raised the dead, come forth when Christ came. Nobody can do that. But you can't obey a form of doctrine of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Romans 6, 17, and 18. And that is to be baptized, buried with your Lord in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Why raised to walk in newness of life? Because your old life has ended when you repented. Your purpose now is to be obedient to God in all things. And thus you're born anew. You know, think about it for a minute. You die and then you're buried. Well, you die to the practice of sin when you repent. Now they bury a dead man. Those folks who want to say, well, you're saved back there the moment you believe without any other acts of obedience. Well, that's a live man. And those same people will bury that man in water because he can't get into that church unless he's buried in water. So it's easier to be saved by Christ than it is to get in that church per their own doctrine. Now, I didn't make it. They did. So it is that when one dies to the practice, the habitual practice of sin, and that's at repentance, and then is willing before men to confess that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, and another step of becoming a Christian is mandatory, Romans 10.10, 10, Matthew 10.32. He's qualified before God to now to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. And that's what those in Rome had done. And thus you have it rehearsed in Romans 6. And then 17 and 18 of Romans 6, God be thanked that you were, past tense, used to be, the servants, the slaves of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine, that form of teaching, that pattern of teaching, which was delivered to you. Well, when was it delivered? When somebody taught them the truth. You're then made free from sin and become the servants of righteousness. But not until you obey the form of doctrine. You can be as sincere and devout as you want to be, a believer in Christ, but if it doesn't lead you to comply with the rest of the teaching of the Christ, who's our Savior, who shed His blood for the remission of our sins, which is to repent of sins following belief and confess one's faith in Christ and be baptized for the remission of sins, then you're not a Christian and you're still lost, religious but lost, and even a believer in God and Christ and the Bible, but lost. Now, there was a time when the church of Christ, as that term is defined and used in the Scriptures, would let people know that denominationalism is not Christianity. I, I shudder to think of all the people who are dying in denominationalism thinking that they're going to open their eyes in glory. And they don't. And yet in the church today, we have a lot of folks saying, well, they're as good as we are, whatever that ever meant. Well, we can only be good as God defined good in the way that men become good according to the truth of the Bible. If you have friends and family in denominational churches, they need to know that's not New Testament Christianity. And they can be as sincere and devout as they want to be 
And they can believe in God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus as the only begotten Son of God. They can believe the Bible is the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient and final revelation of God. But if they will not completely obey as the New Testament teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, they remain in their sins. Sincere, zealous, and devotedly lost. They never have been baptized for, unto, in order to a certain end. And what is it? The remission or forgiveness of sins. No one is a Christian till they've done what Paul did in being baptized for the rest of sins. No one has. We love them when we tell them that. We don't love them when we hate to let them know we don't think they're Christians. Folks, they're lost in that case. They need the gospel. And still, denominationalism is the predominant view, false view, that people have of Christianity in the United States and much of the world. And the Lord's church is not doing its work as it ought to in that situation when we don't let people know, no matter how zealous and devoted they are to God and Christ and the Bible, but they will not obey Him completely in being baptized into Christ and then living a faithful life. Or any other error that certainly one must refuse and re, uh, reject, repent of. We have that obligation as the church of the living God to tell them the truth. Don't you get aggravated at politicians? And say, oh, we've told you the truth on it. Do you really believe them? Well, what about the church and the great commission that's our obligation to know and preach and the godly life we're to live as Christians? And yet we say... Well, I don't think I want to mention that to my good friend or family member that's in the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, or whatever other church considers itself to be a sectarian denominational body. Brethren, those folks are lost. Now, look, if they're not, I see no reason for the Church of Christ to exist as we have it today. There's just no reason. We Pick one that's out there. Or at least say, I, I, I can't pick one that suits me, but since they're all part of the one body of Christ, let's start one that does suit us. And that's basically what's happened over the last 30 years in these community churches. That's basically what's happened. We'll just simply say, if you believe in God and the Bible and Christ the Son of God, then what else really makes a difference? Well, the only person that can make a difference is God and what He teaches in the Bible and it'll read and teach on the last day just exactly how it reads and teaches on this day. John 12 and verse 48. Now let me close by talking to the members of the church more so concerning, well, all you need to do is be uh, sincere in what you believe. But what about members of the church on that? Is sincerity for the church member the only thing required of one to be a faithful child of God? If that's the case... Uh, then let me ask you this. Why is most of the New Testament written to Christians about how to live the Christian life? How to be faithful in the church? Does Colossians 3.17, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him, does, does it apply only to those who are becoming Christians? Well, back up a minute. Let's see Colossians, the church in Colossae. Paul wrote a letter to the church at Colossae and told the church to do that. So there must be a problem there. We're Christians, but you're not abiding according to the authority of the head of the church and the Savior of the church, Christ. So you need to do that. That's how you are faithful. Now, to whom was James, inspired of the Holy Spirit writing, when he wrote James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26? He wrote these words, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith. If it hath not works, is dead, be alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. 
He says, show me thy faith without thy works. And I'll show you my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed or reckoned unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. No wonder Paul would say in Romans 12, 1 and 2 that we're to present our bodies living sacrifices unto God. We're, we're to renew our minds. No wonder James says as a part of Christian living in verse 27 of James 1 that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and, their, and the widows and their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Will sincerity alone save one? Be sincere in what you do and God will accept it. Well, I think you can see that from our study of the Bible regarding this topic that we have learned, first of all, it's simply not enough to be religious or even to be sincere and zealous in religion. Indeed, yes, truly, we must be sincere and zealous but it's alone those two things by themselves aren't enough we must be in the true religion as set out and defined by the new testament of jesus christ remember jesus said if you continue in my words then are you my disciples indeed and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free then in his prayer, John 17, 17, Father, set them apart. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I believe that since God has given us the Bible, he expects us to read it with the proper disposition of heart toward it, and we can learn what one must do to become a Christian and then find the church to which he adds every person who becomes a Christian. Acts 2, 38, 41, 42, 47. And that's not nearly it, that's it. Now, let's be sincere. Let's be above that honest. Let us be zealous for the truth of God. But there's the key for the truth of God, the gospel of Christ, the way of salvation as it set out in the scriptures. Let us study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. If you're subject to become a Christian, we study plainly what to do. And sincerity alone is not enough. We studied the whole plan of salvation. If you will from the heart believe and obey that, determine to live a faithful life in the Lord's church to which he adds you when you're baptized for the mission of sins, heaven will be your home. And as a child of God, did you hear those words from James and Colossians? Truth written to churches regarding their conduct and being faithful. If you need to repent of sins as a child of God, then we urge you at this time to hear the invitation of the Lord. Or if you need to obey the gospel, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.